With Jujutsu Kaisen chapter 267, this is going to be one of those chapters that live in infamy. You're either going to be loving the chapter or you're going to hate the chapter. There is no in between, which I'm going to put my bias out there right away. My knee jerk reaction as a huge Mahito and Sukuna fan was to grab a bottle of whiskey and contemplate drinking the whole thing because no bar being confirmed to be alive, it hurt me, no pun intended, down to my soul. But since this is a review, we're going to be taking the emotions out out of it and we're going to be looking at both the chapter as well as the subtle foreshadowing that was in our faces this whole time which should put out some of the fires of people saying that this is Jujutsu Kaisen Mickey Mouse edition public domain expansion Mickey Mouse Clubhouse <laughs> We open up chapter 267 with a flashback to that ever so important time skip where everyone is training for those weeks in order to prepare for the Sukuna fight and right away you see Gojo inside of Okotsu's body evident by the mannerisms of his face being pretty similar to how Gojo normally looks and we see the tail end of their body swap training where Yuta was learning to use Gojo's body and powers. Gojo is looking at Yuta crazy because he has now demanded the ever so important final finger of Sukuna and Yuta calls him out on it by saying that he knows he's hidden it somewhere and that Gojo needs to give it to him because Yuta has a plan to use his copy technique on Sukuna's shrine which at face value you would think hey this makes a lot of sense just given how overpowered Sukuna's techniques are but Gojo shoots it down but not for the reason that you might initially believe. While Gojo was revealed a few chapters ago to not be the biggest fan of the whole idea of Okotsu taking over his body to fight against Sukuna partially because he was so confident that he would win but also because of the danger that comes from Yuta undergoing this but the true reason why Gojo shoots this down is based off of cold heart logic and it makes you pause and remember just for a bit that Gojo is a genius prodigy talent. He flat out says that he doesn't think one finger alone would be enough to break down Sukuna's shrine and those techniques because it's only 120th of Sukuna's overall power level which even Yuta has can see that this is the case. Recalling how he originally learned cursed speech and we get a nice nugget of info of how he learned cursed speech and how it can be used to be transmitted through objects that can transmit a voice which now makes Inamaki's appearance a few chapters ago make a lot more sense. Gojo's he's taken a step further by saying not only would it run the risk of not being effective but they might end up losing their loan connection to Sukuna and that is too big of a risk to take. What we're seeing here is Gojo taking precautions and that's what makes this whole thing interesting. It's one thing for him to show bravado and bluster that he knows he's going to win against Sukuna but here he's still covering his bases not wanting to take the chance of the finger being out of their possession due to what it would mean which that level of caution it makes sense just given who they're preparing to go to war against the strongest jujitsu sorcerer of all time Sukuna himself this leads to Gojo giving an unorthodox answer one that will make a lot more sense as we get deeper into the chapter. He tells Yuta to approach Yuji. Yuta then tells Yuji how the process of copying techniques work, saying that the body part required depends on what he's trying to copy, how much he wants to use it, and how strong he needs the technique to be, which makes sense when you look at all those moments prior where Yuta was collecting cursed techniques like Pokemon badges a lot differently now, which takes an even bigger turn when Yuta gives one more alternative condition, which is he can use a binding vow to work work around not ingesting a large amount of the body that he describes as being potentially lethal to get the maximum amount of effect out of the technique he copies. This leads to our lovable country bumpkin Yuji asking a question that's so simple it's brilliant at least at the face value. Asking so what if you took Gojo Sensei's arm then you copied Limitless and he used reverse curse technique to restore that arm. Mission accomplished right and it's a childish approach to look at it the same way a child might cut corners to get out of doing chores properly or look up cheat codes when they're playing a video game. But what we're seeing here in just this one moment is so brilliant because it is a glimpse into the childlike innocence in the way of viewing the world that still exists within Yuji despite everything he's been through because after all the damage he suffered mentally throughout the series itself, nobody would blame him if his inner child and his childlike way of viewing things would have faded away. Yet here we see that goofy child from chapter one, he's still there. Even if he's been sullied a bit by the jujitsu world. However, Yuta shuts this down by revealing the moment the body part 
is what generate it, it makes the technique he copy invalid. And Yuda runs through the small list of names who have body parts missing that allow him to use their techniques, like Charles, who doesn't have his rib right now, so Yuda can use that technique when the time comes. It's not much, but Gay Gay is breaking down even further how Yuda's technique works, and it goes a long way towards showing that even for as broken as his technique is, even it still has limits. But what's also done here is that it makes you appreciate all the steps that Yuda went through in order to get us to the point we are now, where Yuji is making his final push in the real world as he's battling Sukuna to defeat him. None of this would be possible without Yuda. But how do they get over the last hurdle, especially Yuda telling Yuji all this information in such a detailed manner as he is. Well, first, Yuda is aware of Meimei's concern that the risk of resonance with Sukuna and Yuji might blow their plan apart. It's a calculated risk on the part of Yuda. He's basically banking on the fact that Sukuna and Yuji won't be able to read each other's thoughts and that in the event of Gojo losing to Sukuna, there's gonna be enough chaos breaking out that this information stands a chance of basically being buried. So even if he's wrong, so long as Yuji doesn't lose his composure in the fight, they still have a chance to win. Make no mistake, it is a gamble, but it is very calculated. Yuda then tells Yuji what Gojo said way back in season one of the anime, where Gojo told Yuji that one day he'd be able to use Sukuna's curse techniques. And we all know what Gojo saw to six eyes is indeed true because we've seen Yuji use Sukuna's techniques a few times in the expanded fight that we've been seeing. That brings us back to the current fight where a banged up Yuji is continuing to fight Sukuna and Sukuna realizes Yuji is missing two fingers and Sukuna, his mind is quickly running through all the possibilities and he realizes that there was a hidden meaning to Okotsu's taunt earlier that Sukuna had not been able to find his final finger and that was our sign where Sukuna realizes that deep down he might be into some deep shit. As he can considers the very real possibility that Yuda copying Shrine, he was able to do so because he consumed Yuji's missing fingers and not his own. We then cut over to Unahime and we get the information broken down about Sukuna's fingers being special great curse objects that can hold out against Jujutsu and Force, but they're now openly wondering if maybe perhaps the curse technique can take it down. By bypassing the binding vow and focusing on letting a curse technique flow through it, they might be able to destroy the finger and this is where the gut punch happens for my fellow Mahito fans. No bar, she is a lie, and they're going to use her curse technique to bring down Sukuna, which that makes sense. Now, you might be wondering, how in the world is No Bar alive? That might be why you even clicked on the video, and the answer has been sprinkled in our faces the whole time. So, let's walk through it a little bit. It all goes back to the original Chekhov's Gov moment, where we had that iconic scene where Mahito, he landed that attack on No Bar. We got told right there that while we shouldn't get our hopes up, her odds of survival they weren't zero. There was always still a chance. Now, longtime viewers of the channel, you guys have heard me say over and over with certain elements, you don't introduce something without it coming back up into play later on. If there's a gun on the nightstand at some point by the end of the story, it needs to be picked up and used or play a role in the story or else it's not needed. It's the same thing that applies here. That moment was a Chekhov's gun. Throughout the calling game, we got small teases that can be easy to overlook, like Yuji being worried about no bar being replaced and when he first got to ask Fushiguro about her condition there was never an answer by Fushiguro about the status of her condition Yuji just made the assumption she was not coming back and Fushiguro would not look him in the eyes and I get it the intention of the narrative was for you to look at that and think it as well even though Gege had for the second time in the major arc the culling game arc it was all meant to remind us that Nobara hey you might not want to forget about her as a reader also when Gojo was unsealed and brought up to speed about everything that happened, learning that Nanami had passed away, Shoko reveals that she hasn't fully recovered yet. The person who has all this insane skill with reverse technique is saying that someone, a she, hasn't recovered. Nobara's name she has never directly said, but that is the only she that fits into that description. It's another subtle moment hidden in the narrative buried beneath all the context of their conversation and the looming battle of Gojo versus Sukuna that span longer than Goku versus Frieza, which has a long ass fight. They were never going to make Itadori aware of the fact that she was still alive for the same reason. They're being extra guarded about what information they're telling him now. Just because her power 
it was a thorn in the side for Maito. It would also service one for Sukuna. And she was basically their trump card. If Sukuna even caught wind of her being alive, he is someone smart enough to piece together everything mid-fight and begin taking measures to defend himself. Now, I will say, I would have liked for there to have been a little bit more of a trade-off for a revival. But given she's wearing that eye patch, I can kind of see the trade-off. But you got to really dig into Nobara's character. So she has long-lasting damage here. And she's always been a bit vain when it comes to her appearances. So this would be something that would be a fate worse than death for her. And it gives her character room to grow from her mistakes. One of the first things that she is shown doing when we first meet her is getting upset that she wasn't one of the people approached for the modeling work in the first arc of the story. Now, we did see Nobar among all the people who died when Yuji was speaking to Sukuna. But this goes back to the literature concept of the Umbrella narrator which in this case the unreliable narrator that was Yuji who did not know that Nobara was alive so when he was projecting his sadness onto Sukuna he in his heart believed that she was alive now taking it a step further in Jujutsu Kaisen MV we see Sukuna's finger shown with the nail in it and in the frame next to it there's a nail which that was also another nod to Nobara her being alive also lines up with what Gege said a few years ago after we finish that bloodbath in Shibuya which is that at the end of the story it's either going to be one member of the main cast who's alive or it's going to be all the members of the main cast alive or it's going to be all the members minus one who are alive which now given Fushiguro was helping Yuji and now Nobara it looks like we have our answer to which path the story is currently taking. Jumping back to it though we get another payoff of that fake death scene from season one where Yuji was brought back to life and he faked his death and they kept it a secret from everyone, most notably Nobara. And we're basically having Yuji get a taste of his own medicine. And Nobara, she is the one who's pulling this over on Yuji. Even if it wasn't initially intentional, it makes sense from a payoff perspective. And it is fitting that she is preparing to drive one of the final attacks into Sukuna since back during the Mahito fight, when Yuji was near his breaking point as he is now, it was Nobara who filled him with hope. So we're coming full circle on a few major parts from the first couple couple of arcs of the story. Nobara, she slams her nail into Sukuna and Sukuna immediately realizes what happens. That this was Nobara and that the damage being done to him was working to such an extent he knows Yuji's sure hit effect of his domain is going to land and Yuji tears into Sukuna with dismantle before slugging Sukuna. However, as you would expect with Sukuna, this stubborn SOB, he isn't going down that easy and he's continuing to battle back and he's taking note of the fact that Yuji hasn't been here healing his wounds and so he should be near his limits yet the one thing that Sukuna hasn't taken into account for is Yuji's stubborn ability to dig down deep and finally show that Arame was right about being worried about Yuji's potential because he lands him with another black flash and the narrator tells us this is finally the end to the long fight with this likely being the final punch that jars Fushiguro free from Sukuna via Yuji's attacks hitting that barrier containing his soul which was already loose given that Fushiguro was helping Yuji earlier and and the moment we've all been waiting for is finally here. The boy Sukuna never acknowledged and always looked down upon. The boy who was the strongest in the sense that he wasn't the strongest as a traditional sorcerer, but he was the strongest at his school. Before he became a sorcerer, he's now the one who brings down Sukuna. While this appears to be the end of the fight and it's winding down, your time here on Anime Explained doesn't have to be over, so make sure to click here to watch one of these videos on the screen.